Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome in our first uh, ANZEV ECR workshop from this year. So we are very excited to have this first workshop related on the new MISEV guidelines. So I'm Dalila, I'm from the University of Queensland. I will chair this session uh, with my colleagues, Lauren. Um, so before to start, I will just give you like some brief overview of today workshop. So um, this uh, workshop will be first of all recorded, so, and it will be available online. Uh, so we will have a discussion from one of the key authors of all the MISEP guidelines and followed by an interaction session. So you will be able to unmute yourself and um, raise your question to Clotilde. So Lauren, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, so in terms of the questions, um, we anticipate that Clotilde's presentation and the general discussion is going to cover most of the aspects that you'll be interested in. Um, but we also do encourage you to then refer back to the MySAP guidelines document after this session and the discussion for further information. Um, so the intention here is really to deconvolute the MySAP guidelines and make them more approachable for everyone, including the ECRs. Um, so with that, I think we'll introduce our speaker. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Clotilde Thierry here from the uh, Institute Curie in um, Paris, France. Um, she's an in INSERM Director of Research, uh, and she has the team Extracellular Vesicles, Immune Responses and Cancer. Uh, with scientific interests focusing on EV communication between tumor cells and the uh, immune, uh, immune system. Uh, Professor Thury organized the first international workshop on exosomes in Paris in 2011. And this led to the creation of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, for which she served as the Secretary General from 2012 to 2016 and more recently as the president in 2020 to 2022. She was the editor in chief of the Journal of Extracellular Vesicles from its creation in 2012 until 2019. And alongside Kenneth Whitworth, she has led the community-based efforts for standardization and reproducibility of EV research. This resulted in the minimal information for the study of EVs, uh, the 2018 article, and now the recent update of these guidelines in the MISEV 2023. So we welcome Clotilde Thierry, and um, you are welcome to take it away now. Thank you. Thank you for the, this nice introduction and for the invitation to um, present the MISEV guidelines here. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to do a relatively short presentation um do you see my screen properly yeah all good and do you hear me properly yes <laughs> okay <laughs> so yeah so um well the, the the goal of this session is to present the MISEV, the, the most recent iteration of MISEV guidelines i uh, will just introduce a little bit the, the reasons behind uh, putting together these guidelines so as you probably know, all of you, if you are working on extracellular vesicles or want to know or, or to work on extracellular vesicles, uh, extracellular vesicles are, are structures that are released by cells in their environment. Uh, they are lipid, they are uh, uh, surrounded by a lipid bilayer that comes from the cell that secretes them. And some of these EVs, uh, EVs is the term, I mean, the acronym for extracellular vesicles. So I'll use it a lot. I hope you will follow me there. So some of these EVs, they bud from the plasma membrane. It's on the right of this slide. Um, some buds from a particular uh, places of the membrane, like membrane extension, philopodia, uh, and so on, but some others uh, bud from any place of the plasma membrane. Uh, and another type, I mean, this, this uh, plasma membrane derived vesicles, they have been called micro vesicles, micro particles, uh, oncosomes, and now the term we like to use is the term ectosomes. But some other vesicles, they form first, first inside the cell in multivesicular compartments that contain internal vesicles. And when these um, multivesicular bodies fuse with the plasma membrane, their internal vesicles are released outside. And that's the particular type of uh, EV population that we recommend to call exosomes. 
Uh, I just want to highlight here on this slide that um, the, the, the size of exosomes is the size of the intraluminal vesicles as observed by electron microscopy, which is generally between uh, about 50 nanometer and, and maximum 150 nanometers in diameter. But this size can also be the size of the smallest uh, EVs that bud from the plasma membrane, the smallest exosome. So the term small EV would cover both of these uh, types of vesicles. Uh, whereas uh, ectosomes budding from the plasma membrane, they can also be much larger because there is no constraint in size uh, for the EVs that bud from the plasma membrane. And that's why these largest EVs uh, cover uh, only uh, plasma membrane DRS vesicles, but, but uh, any type of vesicle. So a question that arises uh, when you see that there are all these vesicles is do these different EVs have uh, different or do they have similar function? And it's a very important question to to ask yourself when you uh, work on EVs, because, uh, well, as I said, most uh, cells secrete uh, EVs of, of uh, most cells secrete EVs of different subcellular origins. And in a previous work we had published in 2017, we had compared the functions of different uh, rough populations of EVs that we had separated. And, and we could say, we could observe that in the function we were analyzing, uh, some of these uh, different EVs, uh, I mean, these different EVs could have this, the apparent same effect, but in some specific more subtle effects, the, the effects between the different EV subpopulation were, were different. So uh, there, there are some functions that are common to all EVs and there are some uh, functions that are specific. And it's uh, really, uh, the, I mean, a few years ago when we published this review, we, we had realized that really most functional studies uh, analyzed variably heterogeneous mixture of EVs with potential contradictory function, which is illustrated on the left. If you have a heterogeneous mixture of EVs and you use um, a preparation of EV that allows you to recover, let's say, a relatively, uh, I mean, enriched population in one of the vesicles that has a positive effect on your function. You will have a, a, a see, you will see some effect. But conversely, if you use another method that will uh, uh, lead to the isolation of another uh, uh, enriched population of EV which has a negative effect on your function, then you will see a negative effect. And then if you have if you use a mixture of all the EVs because your separation method does not separate the different types, then you may end up having no effect at all because you have mixed uh, the, 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 the positive and the negative uh, EVs. So it's really important in any comprehensive studies of EVs to uh, consider the heterogeneity of the, the EVs in terms of nature and their biogenesis, their function. And that's, that's valid for any pathological or physiological system, not only cancer and the immune system, uh, as I'm interested in my group, but any other neuro, neural uh, nervous system, cancer, uh, cardiovascular system, well, anything you can think of. And that's really important to determine what's the best use of EVs uh, also for therapeutic approaches uh, or as biomarker. But the big difficulty is that when EVs are, are uh, outside and when you, you want to isolate them from uh, a biofluid, um, while there are no clear distinction between the different EV subtypes, and uh, this is illustrated here on the top of these slides for the size, where you see the size of exosome illustrated here uh, in light blue between 50 and 150 nanometer, but the, 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 the size also overlaps with size of uh, other uh, uh, extracellular vesicles that come from the plasma membrane or from apoptotic cells. And it also overlaps with the size of retroviruses, which in fact can be considered as a type of extracellular vesicles because they are uh, enveloped uh, uh, membranes. It overlaps also with uh, uh, the size of some uh, lipoproteins. And uh, for the smallest size of vesicles, it's really close to uh, of exosomes uh, and, and small EVs, it's uh, very close to uh, other structures. And at the bottom, uh, what's illustrated is the density of these different vesicles. So if you uh, load your vesicles uh, in a density gradient, again, I mean, some vesicles, I mean, it's uh, often said that the exosomes have a density between, let's say, 1.8 to 1.18 uh, grams per mL. But this is also the density that's observed for uh, the, the, the plasma membrane derived vesicles, for some apoptotic cell derived vesicles, for uh, retroviruses, et cetera. So uh, defining uh, uh, an EV subtype by its uh, biophysical property is, is not really possible, in fact. 
So um, a, a last point of uh, complication that uh, became clear actually in the, let's say, let's last, let's last five years is that, of course, uh, we who have been working on EVs knew that from the very beginning, but somehow forgot it. But cells don't only release extracellular vesicles. They also release other factors here uh, on the left of the figure. They release soluble factors. Of course, they release uh, cytokines, chemokine growth factor, etc. Uh, and they release also uh, other particles that uh, in, in, in uh, the group of David Leiden had described in 2018 uh, and called exomeres, but other groups have uh, um, uh, described other types of extracellular particles that are not surrounded by a lipid bilayer, like supermeres or uh, extracellular nanoparticles and so on. So this is an, an additional type of, of thing that you recover in biofluid and, and uh, so that may be present in your EV preparation. So how do all these secreted factors, EVs, EV subtypes, non-vesicular uh, particles, soluble factors, how do they contribute to the analyzed function of EV preparations? That's really a question that arose a few years ago. So how did uh, um, the, the community, uh, ISEV in particular, deal with this uh, newly recognized uh, EV heterogeneity and the difficulty to separate EVs and non-vesicular uh, structures uh, from the, your preparation? And that's led to, uh, the, the, the re, uh, to us realizing that it was really important to uh, provide uh, information on the minimal requirements or the minimal information in studies of EVs. So it started in 2014 uh, as the ISEF board uh, members, we uh, decided to produce a first a short article called Minimal Experimental Requirements for Definition of EVs and Their Function, um, which touched upon all these different uh, aspects that I have highlighted in my, in my introduction, but in a, in a short version. So this, uh, this uh, I mean, the acronym we would have chosen for this uh, would have been MERDEV uh, 2014, but uh, it uh, didn't sound very nice actually in French. So we renamed it MISEV for Minimal in Information for Studies of 2014. And uh, four, four years later, uh, we, we expanded. We decided that it was necessary to expand and, and involve the uh, uh, ISEF community to generate a new iteration of this guideline, much, much more detailed. And that was the MISEF 2018 that uh, was coordinated by myself and Ken Whitwer and, and uh, 380 other authors from uh, the ISEF members. Uh, signed and, and contributed to these papers. And we accompanied this uh, um, MISEF guideline by an editorial uh, on the nomenclature to explain the, the, the why we uh, recommended to use the term exosomes uh, only for the multivesicular body-derived vesicles and to use a generic term like EVs for the rest. And now, this is uh, uh, why I'm here today, uh, we have just uh, published uh, the the uh, latest update of this guideline, MISEF 2023, which was actually published in February 2024. And it was also produced with a great participation of the ISEF community. Uh, we were five coordinating authors, 68 authors of the rigor and standardization task forces of ISEF and 974 additional authors. So this is the, uh, pa the, the first page of the um, MISEF guideline article, which you can find at this, uh, you can download at this link. Um, it was uh, really uh, well coordinated, as I said, by uh, Josh Welsh, Deborah Gobard, and Lorraine O'Driscoll, uh, Ken Whitwer, and myself, and the MISEF consortium, the 974 uh, additional authors. They are all uh, official authors of this uh, paper, and they are listed in, in PubMed and in the paper. And all these names are names of people who really wrote a strong, long parts of, uh, of the paper and you know, together with their task force member. So uh, I just wanted to, to uh, go over how this MISEV uh, 2023 were uh, produced. So it was really a three-year uh, effort. 
Uh, first of all, in, in 2021, two years after, after MISEF 2018, uh, we uh, submitted a survey uh, to the community to ask uh, what they thought about the MISEF 2018, what was missing, what should be upgraded, uh, uh, what should be discussed in the next version. And uh, the summary article is here. And then uh, based on the, the results of this survey, the ISAF board uh, decided to uh, set up the conditions to generate a new, uh, a new updated version of the guideline. And uh, they assigned a five author committee, as I said, to, to prepare this document. So uh, we wrote a draft. Uh, we uh, uh, pu put forward this draft towards the, the ISAF board for input and, and, uh, and comments and corrections. And we in invited several uh, authors specialized in uh, particular aspects of this, uh, of different parts of the guidelines to write all these drafts. Then uh, what was uh, generated uh, in 2022 was uh, submitted to the ISAF membership uh, as a survey uh, asking for every section uh, for comments, suggestions, corrections, uh, ideas. So we received more than 1,000 responses. And uh, well, that was a really huge work to incorporate these responses, these uh, co corrections, these suggestions into the, the paper. It took really a year. Um, and after we ma had managed to put all these uh, corrections in a new version, we uh, re-reviewed, made it re-reviewed by the board and uh, asked for additional uh, in people to write sections that were missing. And we uh, made a sort of unification of the, um, the style before uh, submitting it to the journal. Of course, we wanted uh, to submit to Journal of Extracellular Vesicles, which is the journal of the society. So we had a pre-submission review and after uh, uh, submitting in the last version, uh, version that were, took into account these comments from the editor, we had three post-submission reviews from uh, uh, other uh, reviewers. So it was again, a long process, four months. But finally, in uh, December, uh, in November, we had a final version. We sent it to the entire community, all these people who had responded to the first survey and um, to get their consensus and approval for, uh, for authorship. And that took again a month or so, and that's why it was finally published in 2024. But the, the vast extent of the work was uh, done during 23. That's why we kept the name. So this is just to illustrate who are these authors uh, who contributed uh, based on countries. Uh, the the most uh, the highest number is from uh, USA, but Australia is not bad as you see here. Then you have lots of uh, European countries: China, also Korea, China, Japan, and uh, New Zealand is here. So I guess reported to you the number of your scientists or population. It's a good <laughs> good score. Um, what's the goal of, of the MISEF guidelines? So really the goal of MISEF 2018 was to increase reproducibility and comparability of EV studies. And uh, the message were, were to explore the heterogeneity of the EV populations analyzed, to demonstrate association of the function and feature attributed to EVs by specific co-isolation, or if not possible to avoid claiming a specific function of EV or exosomes and use instead a less specific term. Uh, in 2023, the same general messages uh, apply on the nomenclature, the EV specific features, uh, but there are more practical details on some EV characterization and isolation methods, and uh, in particular of, uh, for particular EV sources, which uh, uh, ISAF task forces uh, are specialized in. So this is the uh, um, uh, table of content of MISEF 2018. Uh, with all the aspects that are covered, nomenclature, collection and pre-processing, EV separation and concentration, EV characterization, functional studies uh, and general consideration, and uh, a MISEV uh, quick reference checklist at the end. So what has changed in MISEF 2023? First of all, uh, we have expanded the introduction because we had lots of comments uh, on the previous 2018, in, uh, including negative comments. So we have expanded the introduction to really explain what MISEV is and is not. 
Uh, and then we have expanded the nomenclature to include now the term extracellular particles and non-vesicular extracellular particles to, uh, to uh, highlight uh, what we know now of the co-isolation of these non-vesicular uh, factors. We have expanded the uh, collection and pre-processing section to uh, include fluid-specific sections. Uh, we have uh, expanded the separ EV separation and concentration with some uh, method-specific sections. The EV characterization also includes some additional info, info on lipids and RNA, for instance. The uh, uh, section, uh, there is a new sex, section six on technique specific reporting consideration with new, uh, uh, yeah, new techniques that are discussed, which was not so much the case in 2018. A new section seven on EV release and uptake. Uh, we have, by, by contrast, shortened a lot the functional studies section because really the message is the same as for MISEF 2018. And so really you can refer to MISEF 2018 for that. And we have a new section on EV analysis and uh, in vivo. Uh, and we have deleted the MISEF quick reference checklist because we realized it was not really used and maybe not useful. So this is the MISEF 2018 uh, table of contents. Uh, with, uh, like, I just want to highlight, highlight here the nomenclature part with the extracellular particles and uh, umbrella as an umbrella term uh, that's proposed in this section, although it's not imposed as uh, many things uh, in the guidelines. I, I don't want to go through all of this. Uh, we will discuss, I guess, uh, more in the rest of the workshop. Uh, I just uh, wanted to highlight that uh, something that has evolved since 2018 is the, the capacity we have now with the technologies evolving to do a single EV analysis. So there are lots of these uh, parts of the uh, in the EV characterization or in the technique specific reporting. There are lots of parts that deal with um, methods to uh, analyze or, or, uh, or isolate EVs, uh, single EVs. I mean, uh, analyze rather than isolate actually. Uh, for an, an important aspect of the guidelines is to uh, to seek and and the last survey in particular was to ask uh, the authors to say whether they agree or disagree on the different uh, each specific section and this is the summary of the results of this survey as as you see really for every single uh, section a vast vast majority of people agreed completely or mostly. A very low number disagreed, and some uh, said that they did not have expertise in the particular section, which is fine. Um, so uh, an important part that we want to highlight is what MISEV is and is not. And this is really uh, the text that's written in the, the, the MISEV uh, uh, 2023 is and is not section, uh, what it is and that what it is not. I will just uh, highlight the different aspects. So what it is, it's really an introduction to EV research. Uh, it's a non-exhaustive set of examples of uh, various useful EV techniques and platform. And it's an indication of the current broad consensus in the field, uh, but also it highlights some areas of uncertainty and growth. So that's what it is, but it's really not, you should not take it as a comprehensive collection of citations endorsed by ISEF, because that would not have been possible. I mean, many references uh, were proposed by many people. And of course, we, we did not uh, endorse fully all the references. We could not like uh, uh, read in details all these references. So that's not a comprehensive collection of citations. So it's um, MISEV is a recommendation to increase rigor, reproducibility, transparency uh, for EV design, execution, and reporting, a standardization framework, uh, but that supports innovative EV research and applications. Uh, and it's relevant to clinical research and also to non-mammalian sources of EVs. But it's not a one-size-fits-all blueprint of uh, any or a comprehensive checklist of do's and don'ts. It's not either a barrier to innovation for new techniques, it's rather a way to highlight what for any new technique, what, what should be reported to, to, um, to demonstrate or to show that this technique is useful for the EV film. 
And finally, it's a tool to assist reviewers and editors in assessing strengths uh, and weaknesses of an uh, evaluated proposal. But it's not, of course, a substitute for careful and expert judgment. And it's not a means to prevent publication. So of course, when reading, reading MISEV, you should uh, use it for yourself and not just use it to say, well, this paper or this study does not follow MISEV guidelines and it's not good. You should just uh, <laughs> like, uh, evaluate yourself why uh, it would uh, follow or not the MISEF guidelines. So uh, overall, what's the, the what's the message of MISEF? It's really a handful of questions. The first is what terms do you use and what do they mean? And that's the first figure that uh, is in the MISEF 2023 guideline that illustrates the relationship between these different structures that are uh, found in, in biofluids. Uh, so extracellular vesicles here at, are at the bottom left, but uh, they belong to the vesicular uh, component of the extracellular particle uh, 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 secreted uh, material. Uh, there is a non-vesicular uh, part, which uh, we propose to call non-vesicular extracellular particles. And among the vesicular part, you have the EVs, but you also have synthetic EVs and uh, artificial cell-derived EVs. So that's described in the paper. There is a table that uh, explains what, uh, what uh, no uh, names are recommended and which are uh, recommended with caution and which are discouraged uh, unless you have really uh, specific ways of demonstrating that the, the term you use is really what you talk about. Second part is uh, from what uh, and where did you obtain your EVs? Uh, how did you separate, concentrate, characterize, and store them? How confidently can you attribute the function or biomarker to EVs? And, and have you shared your data and reported methods in sufficient detail to enable others to applicate, replicate or reproduce your, your results? And that's a very important of, a part of MISEV. And for this, uh, ISEV uh, recommends to use the EV track uh, uh, website, which has been created by Anne Hendricks and Oliver de Wever, where you can upload the information, the technical experimental information on your data, just to, to see uh, how much uh, details and reporting you have performed, not really to judge the methods. And one important thing I want to, to say to finish this presentation is that really for the uh, EV separation and concentration, there is no, I mean, MISEF does not give a, a, a specific recommendation for a best protocol to isolate EVs from a biofluid because really the best protocol depends on the aim that you have with your EV study. And what you need to do is really to clarify the aim of your study and why you choose this method uh, by putting this method in a recovery versus specificity matrix, which is illustrated in this figure two of the paper where you see a few classical methods used in the field, uh, which are positioned in this uh, read on the right, uh, recovery is vertical and specificity is horizontal and all these different methods, some of them uh, allow a lot of recovery of material but with very little specificity, either to uh, EVs themselves or to a particular subtype of EVs, whereas the most specific of uh, particular subtypes or EVs of EVs are on the bottom right hand side. So it's always really important to uh, con consider how much uh, potential co-isolated factors you have with your EVs, uh, uh, depending on the isolation or enrichment method uh, you have used, and especially when you want to claim an, an exosome or even an EV-specific function. So really, these are uh, the, the, the faces of the people uh, who uh, were really instrumental in this work, Josh Well, Deborah Gobert, and Lauren O'Driscoll, Ken Whitwer and myself. Uh, you have here in the uh, ISEV website, you have uh, you can access the MISEV guideline themselves. You can, I mean, they are open access. You can access them for, from anywhere, but here also there are a few uh, the, the editorials that were uh, published together with these guidelines. And uh, I just uh, wanted to highlight that uh, several parts have been uh, written thanks to the uh, ISEV rigor and standardization task forces, including a few that are listed here, and you can really go to the website also and have a look at the task forces activities uh, to keep an eye on, on what they are doing, and you can also join them if you want. And uh, that's just the last slide about the uh, ISEV, uh, and I think I have, yeah, no, that's it. Um, so 
I, I can stop here. I can take all your questions. I've been probably a bit longer than you expected. I'm sorry. Uh, and let me know if you want me to go back to another slide or stop sharing the, the screen. What's, what's the best? Thank you so much, Clotilde. That was fantastic. Um, you can keep the slides up. Um, as you said, we might want to flip back to some of those. Um, we're going to start by throwing it out to the audience. Um, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, we want to encourage interaction um, and discussion here. So put your cameras on, unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, hello. Hello. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just trying. I, I may have to stop sharing or stop the presentation just for one minute here because I, I was not seeing you anymore. So I'm going to try to just uh, re reset the presentation now. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can I can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'm from India. So we work on this plant extracellular vesicles. So uh, the guidelines, what have you suggested? Uh, are they also applicable to? exosomes or extracellular vesicles in the plant? Well, the general message is applicable to any extracellular vesicle because the general message is really, you know, to 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 keep in mind that when you have a biofluid, you don't only have EVs, uh, you also have all these other things or that are present in the biofluid, proteins, uh, particles, etc. So for plants also. Uh, for plants, another well, I, I know for plants um, you can recover some fluid without uh, breaking too much the the, the plant tissue. Uh, mm -hmm. But for any any uh, whole tissue where you want to isolate EVs, you have to take into account another uh, difficulty, which is that if you want to recover a fluid from a tissue, you may have to break. Um, some, I mean, the, the components of this tissue, in particular the cells, and if you break cells, you may end up recovering not only extracellular vesicles, but also intracellular vesicles because you have broke, broken the cells and made them open. So that's that's another difficulty. But I know that in plants, uh, you can, you can uh, centrifuge them uh, lightly and, and get biofluid. Uh, I, I now... Top of my head, I don't remember if we have uh, if we have in the table of content if we have uh, something on EVs. Maybe I can put the table of content here. Yes, uh, no, we don't have plants in the table of content because pro because uh, you know the, this uh, section three is on the specific um, uh, biofluids. And we did not have a task force uh, dedicated. These this were all written by the task forces of the rigor and standardization, and we don't we didn't have one in plant. We have one, I think, that's uh, being created now. So uh, we will have recommendation for plants uh, in the future. Yeah, because uh, in plants there are two kinds of EVs, or I wouldn't say EVs, because the authentic ones, which are usually purified by vacuum infiltration, with very gentle methods without lysing the tissues. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, there, there's a separate group of people working on plant-derived nanovesicles where you basically grind the plants, you know, they really disturb the tissues and uh, there are a lot of papers coming up on plant-derived nanoparticles, nanovesicles, where obviously these are artificially produced vesicles from plant, but they have all the bioactives. So this would come under your artificial vesicle, isn't it? Yes, exactly. I was going to put this this nomenclature. I think this what you described would definitely uh, fall into the artificial cell derived vesicles, which this this covers uh, all the the vesicles that are uh, produced by manipulating the the cells, extruding the cells. I think it's uh, more detailed here. Um, the the artificial cell derived EVs are the EV mimetics that are produced in the laboratory under condition of, of induced cell disruption, such as extrusion. So I think what you describe is exactly that. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks. Mm. So I think we have a, a question in the chat. Um, so can you please tell me the extra difference between these two terms, like bacteria exosomes and bacteria outer membrane vesicle? Thanks. Well, if we have the definition of exosomes, as I've illustrated in my first slide, which here in this uh, table is the uh, 
vesicles that form in the endosomal or in the intracellular system uh, in, in multivesicular bodies, which are generally endosomes. Endosomes do not exist in bacteria, right? Bacteria do not have intra, intracellular uh, subcompartments. That's the definition of a prokaryote as opposed to a eukaryote. So bacteria do not produce exosome, full stop. They produce extracellular vesicles, yes. And some of these extracellular vesicles, they, uh, I mean, the bacteria, you know, depending whether you have uh, working on gram positive or gram negative, uh, like the, the ones that have two membranes, they will pro pro produce vesicles from their outer membrane. So that's what's called outer membrane vesicles. Uh, but they're also, um, I mean, the, 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 the ones that don't have two membranes, they will produce. Uh, uh, vesicles that come from their uh, single membrane, um, which is not an outer membrane, and in that case, and uh, but but they are even the the uh, I'm sorry because I'm always confused between the gram positive and gram negative, which ones have two membranes and which ones have only one. But even the one that have two membranes, they also pro pro produce vesicles that come from the inner membrane. We don't. I, to my knowledge, we don't understand exactly the mechanism, but uh, there are these other types of vesicles uh, produced by, by these bacteria. So, well, bottom line is you have extracellular vesicles produced by, by bacteria. They, are, uh, they cannot be produced from internal compartments because there are no internal compartments in bacteria, but they can be produced from either the outer membrane or the inner membrane where for bacteria that have both. And for the other bacteria, well, they come from the the, mem the membrane, <laughs> the surrounding membrane. Is it an answer to your question? I, th I think that sounds pretty good. We've got a couple other questions in the chat. Um, so about markers of EVs, uh, is GAP-DH considered um, an, an exosomal or an extracellular vesicle marker? Um, MySev says it's category two, but people usually use it as a loading control only. Any thoughts on that? Well, GAPDH, yeah, GAPDH is a cytosolic uh, protein mainly. So that's why it's considered category two because, well, I mean, the three categories of markers that, uh, that are uh, proposed in the uh, MISEF 2023 is really the same as what was proposed in 2018. Basically the idea uh, to have proteins, I mean, to, to show that you have a vesicle, the idea is that to show that you have a lipid bilayer uh, enclosed structure. Uh, and for this, a proxy, the best proxy we, we could think of, of so far, maybe there will be other ways uh, in, in the few coming years, but is to show that you have a transmembrane protein a full length transmembrane protein, meaning you have a protein that goes through, a, I mean, that, that crosses a membrane uh, that's in your EV preparation and that's in, it's intact. So it's not a cleaved version or, or something. So that's the first category. And then to show that you have a uh, cytosolic components because the EVs, they have, um, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't introduce that, but they have the same uh, membrane orientation for most of them uh, as uh, the cell, meaning they have, transmembrane proteins exposed at their surface and they contain cytosolic components. So GAPDH is one of the cytosolic components, but depending on the EVs and the cells, you may have it or you may not have it so much in your EVs. And, and I, I think in my lab, we don't use GAPDH generally as, as a cytosolic uh, protein present in EV. So it can be present, it can be not very abundant, generally it's not enriched in the EVs when you compare the EVs to the cells that produce them. But uh, yeah, it depends on your preparation, but it's indeed a, a cytosolic protein that if you find in your EV preparation um, could fall into category two. Do we currently know anything about the pathway with which exomeres are released? No, yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, that's something I'm, I'm, uh, I've been thinking about since they were described. Uh, we don't know if they form in the multivesicular bodies or in internal compartments. Maybe they form in other internal compartments, maybe in autophagic compartments. We have actually no idea to, and well, maybe I've missed um, recent publications, but so far I haven't, 
I, I, I don't know if these exomeres, they come from an internal compartment, compartment which would be, uh, and they would be released when this internal compartment fuses with the plasma membrane or whether they cross the membrane or whether, well, maybe they are, they are formed in the endoplasmic reticulum somehow and are secreted as would be secreted soluble proteins by the regular secretory pathway. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I've seen anything in the literature uh, demonstrating where they originate and how they form, but I cannot exclude that I've missed something. So I'm sorry if someone published something and I'm saying it's not known. No, I think that's that's great. Uh, so we have another question regarding like the EVs derived from human plasma, uh, specifically isolated by uh, using a commercial kit. So our audience is they are asking if the NTA TMEM uh, EV protein markers uh, are enough to identify uh, the EV. So and because the manufacturer usually they used to call them exosomes, and they are asking if those methods are enough to call them like exosomes. So. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very good question. And that was actually the, the reason these kits were the reason why we initially in 2014 uh, started the, the guidelines. Because first of all, I mean, you cannot say, I, I don't know what kit uh, uh -huh. the person, I don't have the chat. I mean, I could have the chat if I, uh, if you don't, well, I can uh, put the chat on. But well, I don't know what kit uh, this, this, um, this, uh, the person is as, is using some kits they are just precipitation maybe i can go to the the slide of the the methods so some kits they uh really use a very broad method like the precipitation which is here on the top left and which allows high recovery of material but really no specificity to ev subtype especially not to exosomes nor even specificity to EVs. And you co-isolate with this precipitation kit, you co-isolate EVs, but also all the other um, um, particles, because what you do with this kit is you eliminate water. So uh, e some other kits are more specific. Some of them use uh, some affinity precipitation, which is really more specific. That's at the bottom here. Uh, which uh, can be to uh, more specific to isolate EVs and not the non-vesicular uh, components. But again, it will not be specific of exosomes because again, I mean, the term exosome, we really recommend not to use it for any EVs because it introduces confusion if um, it, there is confusion in the literature uh, in using the term exosome for something that does not come, uh, EV that don't come from uh, multivesicular bodies, and then you don't know what you are talking about. So that's the recommendation is to explain why you use the term and, and what you mean behind. But now for the characterization that, that this person uh, is asking, I mean, you can count uh, particles by NTA, but NTA is not specific of vesicles. It will also count particles, which are, if they are big enough to be detected by NTA. So NTA will count particles. It will not tell you that you have vesicles. Uh, if you sh show uh, by, um, let's say, Western blood that you have the different proteins of the different categories, then you can show that you, you have EVs, but you really have to evaluate also how much of the non-vesicular comp components you have in your preparation and in blood, uh, major major non-vesicular components are uh, albumin and lipoprotein markers, uh, apo 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 A one apo B etc. Uh, so you know uh, well, that that's that's the important thing is to demonstrate that you have EVs, but also to check what else than EVs you have in your preparation. And if you don't have only EVs. You just call your preparation maybe extracellular particles. You know, you use the, the global umbrella term and you don't say that you're analyzing EVs, but you say that you're analyzing extracellular particles. That's the bottom line of MISEF does not want to really be restrictive. It just wants to raise awareness of the, the difficulties, subtleties, and how to interpret properly uh, results uh, without forcing to have very specific uh, um, protocols if you don't want to have them. Just present your data in, in a, a safe and reliable manner. Right. 
Um, I wonder, is there going to be uh, another MISA of guidelines in another four years from now? I must say, when we were working on these ones, these guidelines, it was so much work. I mean, it's great to have 1,000 authors. You know, it's it's great to see how much involved the community has been. Uh, and uh, But putting all these comments and, well, oh, I mean, not all, all of them and deciding whether all the comments were, were acceptable or... You know, a lot of people made comments like, please put my the reference of my work in this paper. That's that, you know, we have already a lot of references. So we, we did include some, not all of them. It was so much work to include all these comments into the first uh, version. And there is so much, there are so many aspects so the, of the guidelines that it took so much effort and energy that I'm not sure we will find someone again to have this energy what we have in mind is maybe more to use more the task forces which are really uh, specific of different aspects and and generate maybe some sub uh, sub section guidelines in the future we've been also discussing uh, internally in the board uh, on on the idea of um, creating um, online um, tools or through the web ISAF website so I cannot say yes or no for the next uh, item. I mean, if there will be a next MISEV guideline, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be in the same form. That's great. Natalie. Yeah, we have a question from Natalie. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Clotilde. Um, big thank you for doing this today. Um, we're very much appreciating your time. Um, I have a question which is more about the focus of uh, the field on small EVs for such a long time. Um, and I just wonder what your opinion is on more studies um, needing to be performed on like a complete evaluation of the cellular secretome, um, because I think we might be missing out on a lot of important information. We've been so targeting small EVs for so long um, what do you think of the value in that? And is that a potential future direction of the field? Yeah, no, I fully agree with, with you on, uh, I mean, that's what I've I've been advocating for the last five years or so, is indeed, uh, while the field is focusing on small EVs, because initially it was the, the, the exosome, what we thought at the time were exosomes uh, that, started raising uh, interest, especially when, when there were microRNAs or RNAs found in them. And, and so people started like focusing on these small EVs and discarding all the intermediate, I mean, the, the pre the pre steps of uh, centrifugation, for instance, if you do differential centrifugation as here, and and only focus on the last pellet which contained the small EVs uh, with uh, some uh, some particles also, but and and forget completely about the other intermediate pellets. Indeed, I fully agree with you that we may miss some activities that are much more uh, efficient in let's say the the large pellets. And actually, we we have published. I mean, I, my group has published um, recently. Uh, um, a paper uh, where we, uh, well, where we identified from mouse tumor cell line, we could see that there were lots of virus-like particles, which were a specific subtype of extracellular vesicles in this preparation. But also when we compare the activity of uh, the different pellet, a pellet containing the largest vesicles versus the virus-like particles or the small extracellular vesicles in terms of activating immune cells or uh, inducing antigen presentation, what we observed was what it was really the pellet containing the largest, I mean, the, the largest and maybe most heterogeneous preparation of EVs that was the most efficient and not the pellet containing the, or, or the, the preparation containing the, the most uh, clean, small EV preparation. So indeed, if you just focus on the small EV, you may end up having an activity that's present there, but maybe not uh, as abundant, not as efficient as if you had uh, analyzed uh, the other type of EV. So indeed, yeah, that's 
a comprehensive. Uh, that, that's what I always recommend when you start with a new experimental uh, system is to start by trying to do a comprehensive evaluation of the different subtypes. So indeed doing differential centrifugation is kind of a crude way of separating, but at least you, uh, this way you can see whether your activity would be very abundant in the uh, first uh, pellets of uh, large or dense EVs rather than in the small, and then you can select the uh, subtype or the sub pellet that you want really to work on. Great, thank you so much, thanks. Thank you. Well, I think we have another question from Suzanne. Can you please unmute yourself? Um, yeah, hello. Yeah, it's all very exciting discussions. I want to kind of expand on that last question in the other direction. Um, what do you think how far this whole thing goes in terms of analyzing single EVs or single uh, whatever it is? Uh, will we end up with a one-to-one -one map of the world or... Uh, do, where where does the the meaning of it potentially stop in creating more and more and more subgroups and um, then of course you have to look at time and at the situation in a body um, maybe patterns like sleep and f eating and all this so uh, will we get all frazzled out in the end or do you have insight that there is some meaning in the subgrouping well, yeah, no, I agree with you that, uh, you know, I mean, back in 2016, I wrote a review uh, on uh, in Cell on, on where we are in the EV field. And my conclusion at the end was that at the time we were in the EV field, like uh, immunologists were in the immunology field back in the 50s, meaning like in the 50s, immunologists thought that there were white blood cells uh, and what white blood cells were doing this or were doing that. And then uh, later they realized that there were uh, T cells and B cells among the white blood cells and that they were not doing the same thing. So that's uh, back in 2016, uh, that's when we were realizing that in the EVs we had different subpopulation. Now having single EVs, single EV analysis is really uh, useful to characterize your EV uh, population to see whether you have really very different uh, types of subpopulations in your preparation and with, and to help you determine whether you want to focus on one of these subtypes for your functional studies. But now you will never be able to do a functional study with single EVs. You will also never, well, because you will never be able to, to, to isolate them. I mean, you will be able to isolate them at the single EV level and maybe eventually to do some uh, omic analysis at the single EV. But I agree with you. Will it be, I mean, how will it be useful for, for to understand how they work in vivo? I, I mean, it's, it's going to be difficult. My, my, I, my feeling now is that since we don't really know how to uh, define the different subtypes of EVs uh, that come from one part uh, one part of the cell or from another, the only way we can really define them now is by uh, their their surface comp their surface proteins because that would be like for immune cells. You know that's the way we isolate immune cells by by tagging a surface protein and, and pu pulling, pulling them down uh, with this surface protein or eliminating all the ones that do not express this protein. So that's not going to be single EVs, but that's going to be uh, analyzing a population of EVs that bear a defined markers that you think is the markers that is important for your activities. Uh, maybe at some point we, we will go into defining EVs by the presence of uh, three markers simultaneously and these EVs having these three markers simultaneously, they will have a particular function that the other EVs do not have. Um, but will we, yeah, will we able, uh, ever going to be, I mean, we, yeah, we may be able to at some point analyze the function of single EVs. I'm not sure I'll see that in my living time, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your answer, Katil. Uh, one more question. Uh, Drishio, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm from Sydney. Thank you for your talk. 
Um, I just had a question. So I currently I work on looking at proteins association, soluble proteins association with extracellular vesicles. And the challenge is um, I use the density gradient ultracentrifugation, the differential ultracentrifugation to know that whether it's an actual association or whether it's just a false association as a result of just high centrifugal force and the protein's been stuck in the matrix, which is quite challenging. And I was just wondering if there are any guidelines or an extra step to truly know if it's interacting with the surface protein or if it's just as a result of the methods you choose um, and how we can yeah, overcome that. No. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, well, that, that's that's uh, the whole field of the corona uh, associating with with EV that has been uh, initially pro I mean, shown by Edith Buzash. So Edith Buzash, she had this paper where she was uh, isolating EVs from a cell line and then incubating that with plasma and, and showing that's how she showed that some plasma proteins were sticking to the EV surface. Um, and and that's what what she called corona. Now there is no real recommendation in this guideline, and you're right that that may be the, the topic of a, a future uh, subsection guideline uh, on how to really uh, determine whether a protein is is strongly associated. Uh, but as as you described, the, the gradient, the density, a floating. Um, um, well, yeah, actually, both the floating, the density gradients here, they are in the, the middle. So you can use them either by putting your vesicles at the bottom. And in that case, the vesicles that are lipid bilayer will float. And I think, but I'm not sure it's been demonstrated that the corona uh, will detach mm -hmm. and remain at the bottom. I'm not entirely sure. Conversely, if you use a top-down gradient where you put your EVs on top, they will they will enter the gradient and the corona, if it's detached, should remain behind. But if it's strongly attached, it may remain on the EVs and, and just um, go with them into the gradient. Uh, in our experience, we have notice that when we were uh, so at the first ultra centrifugation we were uh, indeed pelleting uh, proteins together with the evs and but when we were washing them in a high uh, volume of 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 buffer we were losing some of these proteins that were now uh, just probably because they exchanged i mean they, they were Diluted the exchange with the with the the fluid, and they were not so much associated to the EVs anymore. Yeah. Um, and the size exclusion chromatography, which is here at the bottom, is a very good way of separating EVs from proteins because the proteins they remain in the colon and and they exit the colon later. Uh, but uh, it doesn't seem. I mean, if if the association is strong, it does not really separate the EVs from the corona. So yeah, I mean, I mean, the corona can be something specific and important. Actually, it's not. <laughs> I, I agree with you that just doing ultra centrifugation and, and artificially um, uh, associating these proteins to the EVs um, may lead to a non non real corona protein. But uh, yeah, I I would not. I mean, we don't have in the Meisel guideline a specific part on the corona, and I don't really know how to answer, but go go see the paper of Edith Buzash. And there was another paper, I think, from uh, Dirk Dittmer uh, more recently on uh, different uh, methods. There was also a paper from Anne Hendricks um, where uh, she used a combination of SEC and density gradient to separate uh, soluble proteins from, uh, from EVs. So there are a few papers around that you can yes. check. I will have a look. Yeah, it, I do do wash and I do find the protein that I wanted to look at in the pellet, but I'm not sure if that's enough to put it out there saying it's actually associated, but that that might help. Another, sorry, another question I had was for NTA um, doing um, labeling, labeling EVs, the plasma membrane for NTA. Um, I've tried doing a cell mass screen labeling and it shows a lot of reduction in the population that we see versus just doing the normal, like putting in the whole sample. 
versus labeling. Is that something is recommended doing a labeled like nanoparticle tracking? So you mean, well, but N NTA, so the, some NTA is allowed to see fluorescence. Uh, yeah, the ZFU. Not all of them. Yeah, the ZFU, not all of them. The, the fluorescence is, uh, detection is not necessarily extremely sensitive. So mm -hmm. you may, uh, if you only look at the fluorescent particle, you may end up uh, counting much fewer particles than the total because they, they are the fluorescence detection. The problem is then the limit of detection of your method. So that's one point that's raised in the MISEF guideline is that you, you should be aware always of the limit of detection of your method and that, that the limit of detection may end up, uh, may, may induce uh, no detection or no counting of particles when you, you should have. Uh, what I'm not sure in your question is whether you you lose you you say that you lose total particles just when you do the labeling or you you yeah you have after fewer labeling fluorescent. after labeling you have fewer total particles That's yes yes it's the curve just it's the same but the particle total concentration is much lower than when you originally put the whole particle so I'm just wondering it, when so, you put the entire thing it might be just everything. But, not just EVs. No, when that's for sure. When you put, yeah. yeah, no, that's for sure. When you put everything, you you have the entire labeling. But what you describe is more that the technique that you're using to label your EVs somehow makes the EVs uh, like, and maybe the washing that you use afterwards eliminates maybe, some of yeah. the EVs. So that's what you should try to figure out whether it's the technique uh, that that eliminates EVs. We are we are using also nano FCM the nano uh, nano flow cytometer to quantify EVs. We have um, we we have more sensitivity for fluorescent uh, EVs with the nano FCM than with the Zeta View NTA. But uh, so in your case, you should try to figure out whether it's it's the process that eliminates EVs or it's particles that are eliminated uh, because they are not fluorescent. This I. I cannot really uh, answer your question. Okay. Unfortunately, we're going to have to thank leave you. it there. Um, um, thank you so um, much for your time, Patil. Yeah, we've, we've come to the end of the session. We could keep discussing and answering questions all day, I'm sure, um, but we are going to have to leave it there. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been a really fantastic session. Um, and we encourage everyone to go and have a look over the MICEF guidelines and, and see if they can answer any of these their specific questions as well, based on the resources that are available. Um, Clotilde also pointed out some ways that people can get more involved with ISEF. And we'd also like to um, let you know that you can get more involved with ANSEV as well. Um, so feel free to head to the ANSEV website or you can contact the chair of our uh, ECR subcommittee, um, Sumia. Uh, and there's plenty of ECR workshops coming up, um, mini symposia and an ANSEV meetup at ISEV. So if you're attending ISEV in Melbourne this year, feel free to come and approach us and, and have a chat. We'll be happy to, um, to talk about anything science and ECR with you. Um, so thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you so much to Clotil for giving your time and this fantastic presentation. Um, and yeah, we'll leave it there. Anything to add, Dalila? No, I would just thank Clotilde for this amazing presentation and also to taking the time to have this presentation. And also we have a lot of people, which is fantastic, a lot of uh, amazing questions. So so thank yeah. you so much, really. Also to take the initiative to put together like the MICEV, uh, we know that it's a lot of effort and such a big work. So thank you so much for everything. Yeah. Um, and thank you. And I, I just want to say that I see now in the chat that there are so many questions. I don't know. I don't know how you can. Yeah, we uh, tried to get to as many as we could. <laughs> but thank you. And also to all the attendees, could you please fill out the post event survey that will pop up when you leave the meeting as well? And if you've got any ideas for future workshops that you would like to see covered, um, please let us know. Yeah, and the other things, um, I would just remind that this uh, meeting, this workshop have been recorded and probably we will post uh, we will post it online soon. So so thank you everyone for coming and joining us today and hope to see you everyone in the next workshop. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.